It's time for the Bill Ferguson Show. Ferguson, and you are listening to The Phil Ferguson Show. This is show number 230, and a little bit later in the show, we're going to learn about lawsuits from the FFRF, Freedom From Religion Foundation, uh, recently went to their conference in Madison and uh, set up an appointment with one of their attorneys to talk about and give you guys all some updates. So that's going to be very fun. We're going to do that. And before we do that, I'm going to get into something that kind of all started, cascaded, dare I say, from a a link, an article that someone sent me uh, from a website called Market Watch. Um, and the title of the article, in case you want to go find it yourself, is Why Picking Stocks is Only Slightly Better Than Playing the Lottery. Now, first of all, that is clickbaity as fuck. So I really do not like the title because that's not what this is all about. Um, So I do find that very unfortunate. But it is talking about a new study that came out that we're going to talk about here in a minute. The vast majority of stocks don't outperform U.S. treasuries. Now, one of the things that is a little disingenuous about this is it does point out actually factually correct that currently uh, one month T-bills, some of the shortest U.S. treasuries you can buy, pay about three quarters of 1%, 0.75, maybe 0.8 today. The return is very low, and they point that out, and I'm going to talk about uh, U.S. treasuries here for a minute. That is true that the rate of return is less than 1% today, and so if you compare stocks to that, obviously uh, that rate is very low. But sometimes in the past, even the most incredibly short-term U.S. Treasuries pay more. Not necessarily a ton, but 3 4 5 even 6% a year. So keep that in mind. This is not saying that stocks don't outperform three-quarters of a percent. It's saying that stocks don't outperform short-term U.S. Treasuries. So I wanted to make sure that we were clear on that. Um and U.S. Treasuries generally are the least paying thing, and right now they're you know, paying very, very little. So uh, it's not compared to that. The, the study goes back uh, all the way to 1926, and there's a link to it in the article, or you can Google it directly. And I'm going to flip to that here. And that is called, Do Stocks Outperform Treasury Bills? And it is written by Hendrik Bessembinder. Uh, he is a uh, professor at the Department of Finance in Arizona State University. And I actually asked him to come on the show to do an interview, and I'm very happy he responded, but I'm saddened by what his response was. Uh, because of the complexity of the issue, he felt it was best if people just actually read what he wrote, and he doesn't want the possibility of any misinterpretation of his words by doing an interview. Okay. Fair enough. It is complicated. I'm going to give you kind of some details about this. It is a very long and complicated uh, document. It's 40 pages long, lots of data, lots of data, lots of tables, lots of graphs. But what I'm going to do right now, at the risk of being too complicated, I'm going to read you just the abstract. And this abstract has a lot of fancy schmancy investing words in it. It is nuanced. It is complicated. I know you guys can handle it, but this is something that you should probably pause whatever it is you're doing. Uh, if, if you're uh, you know, trying to multitask, you, you may want to take a break and just listen to this. Uh, so here is the abstract from that report called, Do Stocks Outperform Treasury Bills? Quote, 
Most common stocks do not outperform treasury bills. 58% of common stocks have holding period returns less than those on one-month treasuries over their full lifetime on CRSP. When stated in terms of lifetime dollar wealth creation, the entire gain in the U.S. stock market since 1926 is attributable to the best performing best performing 4% of listed stocks. These results highlight the important role of a positive skewedness in the cross-sectional distribution of stock returns. The skewness in long horizon returns reflects both that monthly returns are positively skewed and the fact that compounding returns itself produces positive skewness. The results also help to explain why active strategies, which tend to be poorly diversified, often underperform. So if you understood all of that, congratulations. I had to think about it a little bit and I had to read the study. The basic result of this really long and complicated report is that most stocks don't do very well. A lot of companies go bankrupt. A lot of companies only make an amount equal to or less than U.S. treasuries, short-term U.S. treasuries, which in the history, you know, is 3 or 4%. So a generous chunk of all stocks don't make more than U.S. treasuries. So why take the risk? And there's a lot of discussion in the paper about risk. The problem is that a few stocks do so incredibly well. A uh, couple that come to mind are Apple, uh, Google or Alphabet, uh, Facebook, uh, Exxon, at and you know, things like that. And sometimes those stocks make money year after year after year and have fabulous and great returns. And the big trick is for you, it's really easy to see that Amazon stock or Apple stock or Google has made a lot of money. And Walmart, when it was new in the 70s and 80s, made a lot of money every year. It's very easy to see that we have the data. The question is, how does one find those stocks before they go up and make all that money? And that is very, very difficult to do. So this is one of the reasons why I continually suggest people use index funds, because in index funds, you are going to get the market returns you're not going to get the returns from a basket of stocks that you happen to own. You're not going to get the returns of a basket of stocks that a mutual fund happens to own. You are going to get the returns of all of the stocks. Yes, it can be more complicated than that, but if you only have 20 or 30,000, and especially if you're more than 10, 15 years from retirement, just put it in the Vanguard Total Stock Market Index. Your biggest goal now is to add as much money as humanly possible. My suggestion is 20%. 10 is not going to make it unless you start when you're 22. You need to put in more than 10%. You need to put something closer to 20%. If you're 30 or 40 and you feel like you're behind, 20% may not even do it. You've you got to get really serious about this. But you can't go pick stocks because according to this, 4% of stocks accounted for the uh, increase in wealth. Now, that's a little dicey because that's the uh, the gains in excess of U.S. Treasuries. So if U.S. Treasuries, short-term U.S. Treasuries have, let's just say, a long-term performance of 3% um, and the market makes 10, virtually all of that difference from 3 to 10 is accounted for by 4% of stocks. So if you don't get those 4% of stocks, which is 1 out of 25 right? Yeah, that's right. One out of 25 stocks, you're going to miss the vast majority of those returns and you're going to match or underperform U.S. treasuries. This is not me saying that you should buy U.S. treasuries, although they have their place in portfolios, especially close to or in retirement. But if you're 20 or 30, um, you should not be striving to make two or 3% a year because that's never going to work out. You're never going to have a big enough portfolio. The problem is that picking stocks also is problematic because any stock you pick only has a 4% chance of being one of those stocks that excels. The vast majority of the stocks that you pick 
are not going to excel. That is why the vast majority of individual people who are stock pickers do not do well. We've had that data and we'll have it again and again on the show that individual investors underperform the market by 4 to 6%. Mutual funds underperform the market by 2 to 4%. And part of that is expenses. It's a very important part. But part of it is just the statistical probability of you having one of these very few winning stocks. So again, index funds, index funds, index funds keeps the cost low, keeps the taxes low, and it keeps the probability that you're going to have all of the really big winning stocks in your portfolio incredibly high because they're all going to be there, at least if they're U.S., and the same thing applies to international. So uh, that's just a brief summary. But again, if you want to read this 40-page report, uh, you can go Google it and get the PDF. It's called Do Stocks Outperform Treasury Bills? And it's by uh, Dr. Hendrik Bessenbinder. Uh, unfortunately, he was not interested in coming on the show, but I wanted to cover this a little bit and, and talk about it. And we'll take a little break and go into our interview. My name is Annie Drian, and um, I'm a founder of Cosmo Studios and very and honored to have been a longtime collaborator of Carl Sagan. And I'd like to say that I think it's just the opposite of what you're saying, from my perspective, humbly. One is that I think that science has a, ha, tolerates the unknown in a way that religion doesn't. My argument is not with people who search for God. My argument is with people who feel that our understanding of God is completed. And those are the people who make so much of our existence on this planet such a hell because they really think that they have the right to kill other people, to hurt them because of what they understand God's will to be. That's a very destructive thing. So science, science is the whole methodology of science is saying that we are not permitted these absolute truths that religion pretends to have, that we do not know the answer to these questions. And not only that, but the little that we think we do know, if you can prove us wrong, we'll give you our highest reward. And that's part of the methodology. That's part of the whole functioning of the system itself. So yes, in answer to what Joan was saying earlier, scientists do terrible things. Science, scientists have biases. Religious people do terrible things, and they have biases. But absolutely intrinsic to the whole scientific, the methodology of science is that error-correcting mechanism, which says we must never lose sight of that. That's not in religion. That's not present at all. Talk about humble. It's the fact that we do science and that we can bring ourselves to see that little tiny earth in Carolyn's presentation. That is humility. What science has done for us spiritually is that it has been the only thing that I know of that has compelled us to wean ourselves of our infantile need for centrality. And that was present, that is very much the essence of so many religious formulations of where we come from, why we came to be. It's the sign of mental, mental health that we can bear to think that this planet was perfectly fine for four and a half billion years without us. That cosmic evolution goes on for 13 and a half billion years before we even get here. How long have we been in science? How long have we systematically been looking at nature? Not even 400 years. And yet science gets us out to Enceladus. It takes us out of the solar system. It enables us to wean ourselves of that spiritual narcissism which compelled us to be at the center of everything. So when it comes to humility, when it comes to uh, a tolerance for ambiguity and for the unknown. I think science worships the unknown. I think scientists are most comfortable in that place of not knowing. And that's where they live. And that's, that's the great strength of science. So I would respectfully disagree.
All right, everybody. This is Phil Ferguson. Welcome back. Now I have with me Ryan Jane. How are you, sir? I'm doing very well, Phil. How are you? I am doing great. I uh, have a freakishly high 90-degree uh, temperature here in Chicagoland, and you're not too far. You're in Madison, Wisconsin. That's right. And yeah, for the first day of fall, you uh, sure wouldn't know it. No, no. It's it's. Uh, we had, uh, I think, 94 today, and it should be normally in the 70s. I'm not very happy about this. No, me neither. Now, you're in Madison, Wisconsin, uh, and my listeners may not know. What's the big deal? Why are you in Madison? Uh, well, we have the Freedom from Religion Foundation, where I'm a staff attorney, has been here since uh, 1978. And so we we cover the entire country, but this is where our uh, co-founders are from, and uh, we've never moved. This is still our, our main base of operations. Well, and Madison is one of those cities that I kind of like because you get people from all over the world, in part because of the university. And yep. Yeah. It's a college town. Yep. It's a college town, and it's not that big of a town other than the college. So you really get the impact. It's not like, you know, there's a college in Chicago. There's probably dozens of colleges in Chicago, but there's a really big college in Madison. There's a really big college in Champaign, Illinois, where I used to live. And uh, mm -hmm. now I'm in the Bible Belt of Chicago. So. It's a big shock for me. Yeah, well, and, and Madison has a great, you know, uh, progressive kind of uh, free thinking and forward thinking history. If you look back at like the the Vietnam War, it's this spot in uh, you know middle of middle of nowhere in the Midwest where you have a, a lot of people speaking their minds, even though it's it, it's dwarfed in size by Milwaukee. And yeah, all you got is the the college and the capital, but it's a cool place. I like it a lot. I have created a, a measure. I can tell within minutes of arriving in a city how liberal it is. You know how I do that? How's that? I check the Prius ratio. <laughs> so if there's like less than 1% Priuses, like in uh, Bentonville, Arkansas, or Kansas, I'd like to call it. Okay, well, you know, that tells me one thing. If I go to Champaign and every fifth car is a Prius, that, that tells me something else. Well, I think I'm the only, to my knowledge, I'm the only person at FFRF who drives a Prius. So whatever that tells you. <laughs> oh, we, of course, we could talk Priuses now because uh, I, I own four of them. Wow. I've only got two between me and my wife. But <laughs> Well, what years do you have? Uh, we got 2008 and 2015. Ah, so you're right in between me because uh, I originally had a five and my wife loved it so much that we got her a six and we used those for a good decade. And she finally got a 16, and just a, six months ago, well, I guess maybe nine nine months ago now, I got the 2017 Prius Prime. Wow. Does that look at the 16? I wasn't so crazy about the design changes of the 16. It just looks kind of strange. Maybe I'm just used to mine. I don't know. What, do you, what are your thoughts on that? Well, and it's funny because people often used to comment about the 5 and 6 that they looked very, very boxy and very ugly. And yep. it's one of those things that I really just don't give a flying fuck what my car looks like. So the new ones, they look okay. I, I think the newer ones look more like conventional contemporaneous cars and less distinctive. And so depending on what you're going for, but as far as whether it's stylistic or not, I, I have a, a relative that has a, what do they call it? Chevy, Chevy Mustang. No, that's Ford Mustang. Chevy. What's the Chevy sports car? Yeah, yeah. Uh, Listeners are going to be impressed by us, huh? Oh, yeah, definitely. No, as far as <laughs> if, if you get out of cars that you can't put $20 in and drive 500 miles, I know just about nothing. Yeah, yeah. Well, I had a, a friend once. He said, that car will never pay for itself when I bought my first Prius. And I said, what What? What the fuck are you talking about? And he goes, you, you think it's going to pay for itself? And I go, who said I bought it for that reason? You, you have a Yukon. Did you buy it because it's going to pay for itself? And he goes, no, I, I like to drive it. And I go, well, I have a car that gets 50 plus miles and I like to drive that. So why does it have to be about breaking even? Um, but anyway, enough Prius talk. My listeners are going to be driving nuts because I do this all the time. <laughs> you are a staff attorney at FFRF. Yes. The Freedom from Religion Foundation. And do I understand this correctly? You may be the newest staff attorney. Yeah, that's right. So we are up to uh, seven permanent attorneys at FFRF. So I guess I'm uh, I'm 007, which I'm pretty pretty happy. About. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
And, so, and we have nine total, so we also have two temporary um, attorney positions, legal fellows is what we call them. So we've been expanding at about the rate of one attorney per year for uh, the last decade. So that's really good, steady progress. And it's exciting because we get to do more now that we have this this solid size team. It used to be that our resources were really thin because we cover the entire country. We get about five thousand, more than 5,000 complaints every year. Um, all state church complaints of um, every sort you can imagine. The majority of those are public schools, but it's it, everything you could think of. And so it used to be that you know, we had to really pick and choose. Um, a lot of times there were some violations where it's like, this is a crystal clear violation. We could go after this, but we just have bigger fish to fry and only so much time in the day. So what, what are we supposed to do with only, you know, two or three attorneys? But um, I've been here, I, I was a legal fellow for the last couple of years, so I'm not brand new to FFRF. I've been here for a few years now, but uh, now that we have this solid team of nine attorneys, uh, we're able to do more litigation, more letters, more legislation tracking, a little bit of lobbying. And uh, what I'm the most excited about and my uh, the position that I have right now is really focused on is doing sort of this immediate response to things that come up. So in the past, we've always done this kind of reflexive uh, action where something happens, someone sees it, reports it to us, we look into it, and then we take some sort of action. But we're trying to move to become more proactive where when there is a statement that a politician makes, for instance, saying, you know, this is a Christian nation or whatever it might be, that we can immediately jump on that and take action from the beginning. Uh, and also pushing through good bills. You know, we hear a lot about bad legislation. There's definitely a lot of uh, lawmakers who are trying to push kind of theocratic bills or anything that, you know, is, is put, promoting their personal religion rather than the, uh, the, for the betterment of our secular country. And so we are trying to also get on the other side and get behind some things that will actually move the country in a good direction. So it's all this new frontier for FFRF that is, I think is very, very exciting. And and there's apparently a, a little split, I dare not call it a schism, but a, a little split in the legal department. What What's that all about? Yeah. So, I mean, we, so our legal director is named Rebecca Markert and she's uh, been in charge of FFRF's legal team since she came here, I think nine years ago. So uh, she is the boss of the the legal team, the head attorney. Uh, but we recently, just because we're, uh, we're growing so much, we decided to create a, uh, a separate division that's called the strategic response team. So the director of strategic response is uh, staff attorney, Andrew Seidel, who I understand has been on the show several times. And, uh, and then I'm kind of his, um, his loyal underling attorney. <laughs> so I'm, not, I, I'm a sidekick in, in the operation, but we are heading all the things I was just talking about. So tracking legislation, uh, doing immediate responses to things. We send out action alerts to our, our members. So uh, anyone who's who's listening, if you're interested in helping in the kind of things I'm talking about, you can consider joining FFRF and then you'll get these action alerts that say there's this thing happening right now that you can do something to to help on. So like, for instance, just to, to throw out an example from this week, uh, we saw that the uh, New Mexico State uh, Department of Education released a, uh, pl- a plan to change the teaching standards in the state to remove the, the terms evolution and climate change and also to remove the age of the earth. So the idea, they're tra- trying to sell this as reflecting the diversity of perspectives in New Mexico, but I think we all know that what they're really doing is trying to cater to uh, to young Earth creationists and climate change deniers. So uh, they are holding a hearing on this in October. So we were able to immediately turn around and put out a uh, a statement through the press and then also an action alert to our members saying, if you can make it to this event, you should go to it. Go to this public hearing and tell them that you want science taught in science classrooms and should not be weakening standards. So that's the kind of stuff that we're doing now. Now, if I understood from the conference correctly, the membership in FFRF has been growing and growing and growing at an even faster rate. What's it up to now? Yeah, we're we're just on the brink of 30,000. We're going to be crossing that perhaps in the next week or two. So we've we've been at the uh, over 29,000 range for about a month now. We had a, a big 
a, a big r rocket increase in our membership in January. Uh, it's, it, it would seem that people are uh, unusually afraid of um, of state church issues. I don't know if it was the Handmaid's Tale or um, something else that might have gotten people's uh, concern. But in any case, uh, I think a lot a lot of groups that do what we do saw this massive membership uh, boom. The, the uh, ACLU actually quadrupled its membership to date this year, which is just incredible. So we haven't wow. had uh, quite that number, but I mean, uh, it's it has been just incredible growth. Now I know that you you are trying to be delicate and sensitive because FFRF has no political position. Um, so I will say Trump. Uh, you don't have to. I you don't necessarily even mean to, but I do. So I'm going to do that. Uh, so you've got this membership boom, and they can get alerts. Well, how do my listeners, who are probably very excited about this, how do they become members? Uh, so the easiest way is just go to ffrf.org, and uh, there's a join button right there. You uh, can join for as little as forty dollars a year. Uh, of course, you're welcome to donate more than that. We have. Um, we have a need for uh, for resources for all the different things we do. I mean, so like I said, we have nine attorneys, but we also have an incredible staff of uh, editorial and administrative personnel who do wonderful work. And uh, unfortunately, that takes money. So we we do uh, need we rely entirely on members for everything that we do. So we we appreciate all of our supporters. And yeah, the simplest thing you can do is just become a uh, a member for forty bucks a year. And so when you're a member, you can get probably a convention discount, I hope. Does that, does that sound right? Yep. Right. Yep. So we have our annual convention that just happened. And uh, yeah, you get a discount to come to the convention. It's going to be in San Francisco next year. And um, you, you get some other perks, too, if you're into newspapers. I think that appeals more to some of our older members. But uh, we have a uh, paper newspaper that we do. Uh, almost every month that highlights a lot of our victories and uh, just other stuff that's going on. Uh, and then uh, online as well, we, uh, we besides action alerts, we also send other things. We have um, just a lot of communication with our members, trying to keep them uh, informed and as active as possible. Now, you said San Francisco. That I'm very excited. My wife's very excited. Matter of fact, my wife was so excited at the conference that we just went to in Madison that she signed up as a life member right there on the spot. And I wasn't quite sure how to interpret that because she is not a joiner and has intentionally <laughs> not joined any of these secular organizations, but was so impressed. Now, like, like you mentioned, 5,000 complaints that you've gotten so far this year. Uh, we're not quite at 5,000 this year. We, we get, uh, we, we're on track to have the biggest year uh, yet this year, but on average we get more than five thousand. But it's been between five and six thousand per year for the last couple of years, and that's across the country, all fifty states. Now, if I recall correctly, again, uh, the vast majority of these complaints are actually resolved with just a simple letter. How how does something like that work? C kind of walk us through that. Yeah. So usually, uh, the other thing is that the vast majority of the complaints we get, pr probably seventy five to eighty percent are in public schools. And um, that's an area that I'm really passionate in myself. Uh, my wife is a public school teacher. I have a daughter. And I think it's the most crucial area to com combat uh, the government trying to push religion is with young people who have not yet reached the age of reason. And so they need the protections of the Establishment Clause. And so the way it would work is, um, for example, yesterday I got a, uh, a complaint. It was a third grader whose teacher, this, this was in Wisconsin actually, uh, teacher told them that they have to stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. The kid wanted to sit because uh, she didn't doesn't believe in God, so the objects to the one nation under God language wanted to sit for the pledge. And the teacher said, you must stand. Uh, it is unpatriotic and shows that you don't care about veterans if you sit. Oh, my. Uh, and yep, and and she and then she she tried to soften her position a little bit and said, if you bring in a signed permission slip from your parents that says that you can sit, then I'll let you sit. So we uh, so we took that, and in this case, that, this is one of the clearest violations that we get because the Supreme Court actually decided this issue in 1943. So this is an ancient, long settled legal principle. You do not have to stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. And so um, we send a letter to, in this case, I sent a letter to the, the superintendent of the school district saying, this is what happened. We always keep our complainants anonymous. So we just say, you know, a concerned 
parent contacted us, told us this is what happened, this is the teacher, uh, here's the law, here's why you should uh, take steps to correct it. And then we just ask for a response uh, for assurances that it's been resolved. And uh, typically, especially in cases like that, when we have like pledge complaints, we'll get a, uh, a superintendent who either realizes through the, the letter that they are that we are correct or they'll ask their attorney who will confirm it for them and then they'll take care of it they'll talk to the teacher and that's what i expect to happen in this case i just sent that letter yesterday so we haven't heard back yet but i expect by next week we'll get back a message from the superintendent that says you know guarantee this is not going to happen again and that's what we aim for all the time we we are not going around trying to find anybody to sue we want to solve things as quickly and painlessly as possible. And usually that is what happens with letters. That's why that's what we always do first is we just send a letter that says, here's what's going on, please fix it. And usually that does the trick that that tends to get them to correct their behavior. So anyone that's listening or anyone that's not listening in the course, but they won't hear this. If they have a problem in their school, whether they're a parent or a student, they could write you a letter or contact you. Is there a, a button online that they can go through? Yeah, the uh, if you go to our website, uh, or maybe the easiest way is just to Google uh, FFRF report a compl- report a complaint or re- report a state church complaint, something like anything like that. It should pop up as the top thing. So it's a, a link on our website. We have a form you can fill out, and if you do it that way, it'll make sure that it gets to the uh, the right person. Because again, we have a team of attorneys, and we split up the work by um, both topic and geographic area. So if you I, I would, you know, invite people to contact me directly. But if you give me some uh, school complaint in in Florida, I'm not the one to handle those. I'd have to give it to the right person, and if it might get lost in the shuffle. So the the best way is just to go online and fill out the form there. Well, y- years ago when my daughter was in high school, uh, she came home and told me that every day in the morning announcements they would talk about the uh, what is this uh, Christian fellowship fellowship of Christian athletes. Every, oh, yeah. They were announced every day, but every Wednesday uh-huh. they would bring in donuts and biscuits and bagels and stuff for everyone in the school to eat for free. And they would announce this. And I contacted the school principal, uh, the school's principal's office, the office of the high school. And I said, what, are, what is the policy for announcements? Because if they apply a policy equally and anyone can get an announcement, well, then there's no discrimination, and maybe I'm wrong here. Just jump in. But um, they said, oh, there's no there's no rules. It's just whatever the principal thinks is in the best interest of the students. And, of course, this uh-huh. is all by email, so I have this written down. And I said, great. Well, I want a daily announcement that the uh, Secular Student Alliance from the University of Illinois is going to bring on Thursday donuts and all this stuff every day, and they denied my request. Of course, of course. <laughs> and so uh, with the students, we wrote a nice uh, letter saying that th- they're now ex- showing discrimination. And they came back that the principal thinks one is beneficial to the students and the other one isn't. And I said, you know, we sent another letter um, and we were getting all this pushback. And then all of a sudden, my daughter comes, she goes, all the other announcements stopped. Ah, and I think huh? what happened was that the the people in the office, the principal, the vice principal, all those people were fighting with me. And at one point, some somebody must have contacted the legal department and said, what's going on with this? And all of a sudden, their attitude in, in a matter of an instant just totally changed. And they never announced uh, this free breakfast stuff anymore. Yep. Well, that's awesome. Yeah, that's uh, that's the way to do it. We hear about that sort of thing all the time. And you're, you're right. That's It's a typical scenario that when we ask for equal treatment when, you know, you're, you're right that if they, FCA, the Fellowship of Christian Athletes is usually organized as a student group, not always, but so schools sometimes have a policy that student groups can have, uh, you know, access to the morning announcements, they can announce their meetings or whatever. And um, we've had that with, yeah, Secular Student Alliance or also atheist groups where when those student groups say, oh, well, we want our announcements to happen too, then it's like all hell is going to break loose if we let the atheists in front of the microphone. And so the the silver lining of it is, like you said, they talk to their counsel and they say, well, if you don't want to get sued and lose badly, 
you're going to have to stop this uh, this policy altogether. And that's usually what they do. But of course, that's the right solution. I mean, you have to either open it up to everybody or better yet, just don't use just don't the do school's it. machinery to promote <laughs> any religious perspectives. So you said this thing in New Mexico where they're going to outlaw evolution in the schools and other things. Was that right? New Mexico? It is New Mexico. Yeah. And it's the, it's the, it's not exactly outlawing it. That would be a, a little bit of an overstatement. They're taking it out of the teaching standards. So the teaching standards, uh, they're, they're changing the terms, for instance, from evolution to, uh, I, I think biological diversity, which of course those are not synonyms. So it's, right. uh, it's, a, it, it's not science. It's not a scientific change anyway. They're, you know, it's no longer accurate, but, um, the the other thing is it's like my wife teacher is a biology teacher and uh, she when she teaches evolution she has to mentally prepare for angry parents who are going to come up and be, and say you know you're teaching my kids the religion of evolution how you know how dare you you have to stop and her bedrock that she can always rely on is that she can point to teaching principles that say we teach the principle of evolution you know the the theory of and the fact of evolution. And uh, in New Mexico, that's what they're going to be taking away is teachers are not going to have that anymore. If they, they're not explicitly told, you know, you cannot say evolution in class, but if they do and someone complains, they don't have the standards to fall back on. And then on the flip side of it, if you have teachers who are trying to push creationism, which of course, teaching creationism in public schools is illegal, whether it's called creationism or intelligent design or anything you want, you cannot teach that in public schools they will likely see this as a green light. They will say, oh, evolution has been taken out of the standards. That means I can at least, by implication, talk about you know, how um, biological diversity is the result of intentional design or, or whatever. And so that's the other main worry, is that this is going to lead teachers back down that path again. And again, it's, it's evolution, climate change, and amazingly, the age of the earth is being removed from the teaching standards. So I, I guess the short answer here is all the listeners should go sign up. You said it's 40 bucks. Yep. 40 bucks for the year, F 40 bucks for the year. You'll get all the alerts. You'll get on the list and uh, you can take action on this and many, many other things. I know you guys are doing that kind of stuff all the time. And if you want to, I think, and correct me here again, if I'm wrong, a thousand dollars is life membership. Yes, that's right. And $5,000 is after life membership. So you're not yes. just limited to life. You're a member in perpetuity. Exactly. And of course, it's a little bit of a, um, a play since we are uh, a group that is uh, we're advocates for non-belief. So obviously we are uh, pushing against the uh, the reliance on an afterlife. So it's a little bit tongue in cheek that we have an afterlife membership. But that's exactly the idea is that your your donation will be continuing to benefit the organization in perpetuity after you're gone. So, of course, you know, you get these thousands and thousands of complaints, and most of them are schools, which is really sad. Uh, and most of them get resolved with a letter. But every once in a while, things don't get resolved with a letter. Uh, give me an example or two, because these are the ones people get, sadly, really excited about, including me, because uh, we get to go to court. Uh, so tell me one of those. Yeah, well, and I, I'm with you there, Tim. And, you know, I think at attorneys at, are interested in lawsuits, in a, in a sense, not that we want to sue anybody, but lawsuits are interesting and and it's fun to win lawsuits. So um, it is definitely part of the the draw that makes the, the job exciting. Um, one example, as long as we're talking about schools, we have a, a case in Concord, Indiana right now that is in front of the uh, the Seventh Circuit Court of Appeals. So it's actually going to be in, uh, the oral arguments are going to be in Chicago in about a month. Um, and so this is on appeal right now. What was happening in Concord, at, uh, Concord High School in Indiana is they have a holiday music program that they do that they call the Christmas Spectacular, which already, should, you know, it's it, you, you take a little bit of a pause, but that the word Christmas is in there, but we're not trying to say you can't say Christmas in a public school. It's, that's fine. But the Supreme Court has actually said that there is a difference between the secular aspect of Christmas and the religious aspects of Christmas. So schools have to walk that line. You can celebrate the secular aspects of Christmas. No, no one's going to object to that. You know, reindeer, Santa Claus, everything, not a problem, Christmas trees. But if you start saying we as the public school are celebrating the birth of Jesus, who is our Lord and Savior, now you've got a problem, right? So it's, it's not the hardest thing in the world to understand that. 
what they did is their Christmas spectacular at the end of the show for decades, I think 40 or 50 years, they've had the grand finale be a living nativity where they have students in costumes as Mary, Joseph and whatnot in a nativity. They had uh, all the different students who are in the various music groups performing Christian uh, Christmas songs. And they had a faculty reading from the New Testament, the story of the birth of Jesus. So this entire scene, and this went on for, uh, tw- it was a 20 minute production that this went on. It was the, so again, the grand finale, at the end of the show every year was this just explicitly Christian celebration of the birth of Jesus, which is exactly what schools are not allowed to do. Right. So, so we, we wrote to them, we, we tried a letter at first and said, this is, has several serious problems. Um, namely the, the staff reading the Bible verses is a main, is a big problem. The nativity is a problem, especially because there are students who are participating in it. And, uh, coupled with those, the exclusively Christian music in this atmosphere is, is a problem too. And, uh, the school refused to do anything. They just said, no, we think this is fine. We're not going to, we're not going to change a thing. So in that case, we had really no option but to sue them. And the suit actually had an immediate effect. So this is one uh, nice thing of kind of using this, you know, sort of litigation. As soon as we filed the lawsuit, they made changes to the program. They took out the Bible reading, which was probably the most egregious part of all of this. It's just like they're losing so hard on that issue. It's not even funny. So they, as soon as they talked to an attorney, said, okay, you must cut that. And then the other thing, this is kind of similar to your FCA story. They said, you know, let's balance this out a little bit. Let's try to give some equal time. So they said, okay, here's what we'll do. We'll cut the 20 minutes down to, I think, about 10 or 12 minutes. We'll put in, put in a Hanukkah song and we'll put in a Kwanzaa song. <laughs> and then we'll do the stuff and we should be all set, you know, is what they figured. So they had a... Um, uh, a, a Hanukkah song, which was not in English, and then a Kwanzaa song that was an instrumental, followed by the live nativity and all the Christmas music. So that was, needless to say, I think not enough to make us go away. The lawsuit continued because we are, you know, it's, it's still, anyone looking at that would say you're in, you're obviously trying to promote Christianity with this. And so we, the next step of it was we got an injunction uh, that's prevented them from doing the living nativity part of it. So that was a major victory. And that, but what they did was instead of the living nativity, they put up a static, a static nativity yeah, yeah. with mansions. So they put that on the, on the stage, which we FFRF definitely maintains is still not acceptable. Um, and so we, we fought about that version of the the program. And unfortunately at the lower level, the uh, federal judge held that the, that new program with all the changes, including the static nativity, was constitutional. So we appealed that, and that is the case that's ongoing that they're going to hear in Chicago pretty soon. So we're going to go and argue um, that the, um, the, this Christmas program, given its, its history and the obvious favoritism of Christianity, is a problem. So that's, that's one example of an ongoing school lawsuit that we've got going on in, in the area, too. And it's it's uh, so egregious to me that they they clearly just don't give a shit what what is yeah. right and wrong. They obviously want to promote a worldview that is outside the bounds of what public school should be. Uh, of course, yeah. one of the one of the ways around this, and I don't know if you guys have a position on this, is more and more people are pushing for private schools, and then money goes to the private schools, and then the private schools can do whatever they want. What what are your thoughts on that? We and I personally are uh, vehemently against any uh, any flow of public money to private schools. Um, and I mean, I'm an advocate of public schools in general, um, but the uh, the voucher schemes that have been sweeping the country, and the first one was in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, so it's right and, in our and backyard. How, how we well did that work out in Milwaukee? It's a disaster. It's an yeah. absolute disaster. The uh, there have been program there have been schools that. Are uh, that were abusing the program so badly they were essentially fake schools. Was, they're they're almost completely fraudulent. There were some that don't didn't even have brick and mortar structures. They were just essentially paper schools that um, applied for funds, received funds, 
uh, and then shut down almost immediately and just took the money and ran away, basically. There are other schools that didn't have textbooks, uh, schools that were serving ramen noodles for, for lunch, just all these things that would never fly in a public school, but they can get away with it because they're religious private schools, so they're exempt from all oversight. And then even the, the legitimate, you know, like schools that are trying to, to do their jobs, um, it, there's been no evidence that this has helped kids in Milwaukee in any way, because the narrative they try to sell is that this is a way to pull kids out of failing public school systems, give them another option. That's why they call it school choice, right? It's like they right. have, uh, they have the, like Milwaukee public school is this giant school district that certainly has its issues. And I know Chicago public is, is very similar. And so I can understand the desire to give, especially, uh, low income students in that situation, an option to, to go elsewhere. And that makes sense. But if you do it this way, there are, it it just doesn't work. We've seen that it it doesn't work. Another major problem with it just uh, across my mind is worth mentioning, because I never thought about this until I was working here and learn more about it, is that with typical voucher schemes, the, the usual beneficiaries are not kids who move from public schools to private schools. They're kids who already go to private schools. So this is especially true when the voucher system is made in a um, a tax credit system, which I don't want to get too too technical or um, you know put any of your, your listeners to sleep with uh, legalese. But th- this was proposed at the federal level, uh, and we were actually in Washington lobbying against it uh, earlier this year, where the idea is if you go to a private school, you will get a dollar for dollar tax credit. And the uh, the strong majority of people who will benefit from that are people whose kids already go to private schools. So it's a giant drop in money that public schools get, not because they're losing students to private schools, but just because the parents who are sending their kids to private schools and are already paying for tuition there just don't have to contribute to the public school system anymore. So I think that's just, it's an outrage. And um, anyone who cares about having a well-educated populace should be opposed to to those schemes. I mean, they, they almost can make this sound harmless or plausible or reasonable, but you're taking a large amount of money away from the public system, which hurts the people in the public system. And if there already are problems, makes them worse and gives the money to families that are in private schools that are already probably, if it's an established school, and we're not talking about Milwaukee now, but a long running school, those schools sometimes have an inherent advantage because anyone that's a problem student, they can kick out where the public schools have to accommodate them. And those parents now get a tax break. And most, the vast majority, again, I'm not an expert, so correct me. The vast majority of students going to private schools outside of some weirdness like Milwaukee are going to religious schools. So you're yep. funding religious right. families and you're taking away from people that are in the most need in public schools. Terrible. Yep. Absolutely terrible idea. And it's disproportionately Catholic uh, schools as well, which is not that Catholicism is any worse than any other religions, but it is um, kind of a strange thing. If you're an evangelical or you're Jewish, you're you know any kind of um, non-Catholic religious person, it should concern you that this is a gigantic chunk of taxpayer dollars that are going very disproportionately to Catholic schools. It's just, it's very strange. And that's why it raises the specter of establishment clause problems too. Um, but unfortunately the, the Supreme court has looked at voucher systems and said, it's okay because it's the parents choice to, to make this change. But just the reality of it is that the infrastructure out there is that private schools, like you said, tend to be religious and they tend to be Catholic. That's just the way it is. And another thing is, you know, you were talking about private schools having the ability to kick out problem kids, and that's true, but problem kids is whatever they want it to mean. So that can mean they don't accept gay kids. Obviously, they're, they're not going to accept atheists. You know, whatever criteria they want, they can impose. And so you might be in a situation where perhaps because of your uh, your sexual orientation, you are not eligible for this program essentially because there aren't any religious, any private schools in the area that will take you because maybe there's only one and it's religious school that doesn't uh, doesn't take homosexual kids. So you're stuck in the public school anyway. So yeah, it's just, it's a really messed up system. I mean, and, and to expand on that, because you're absolutely right, it could be because you're in a wheelchair and uh, 
if the Jehovah's Witnesses open up a school and you allow your your child to have a blood transfusion, they could kick you out too. Because yep. they yep. can do it for right. whatever reason they want. That All of this is just the kind of stuff that lead, in my opinion, leads to chaos. Uh, we should have one unified system that focuses on reality and not uh, doctrine by religion, uh, which can vary. And then, of course, in a small town, like I used to live in a small town, if you get one or two private schools that suck away a generous portion of the population from the public school, it has real serious problems because it built infrastructure to accommodate a couple of thousand kids in the high school. And now if they only have 1,000 students, the building costs don't change much, but the revenue falls right. and it makes it virtually impossible for them to break even, which then can be pointed to as, see, they can't, they can't manage their money. Well, yeah. you changed the game on them after they built the building. Exactly. And they don't know. A lot of times they it's not until the like the day before the school starts before they even know what their enrollment is and therefore how much money they get. So they can't budget ahead of time. So they don't know, you know, can we afford to hire these teachers? We don't know how many students we're going to have. So how many math teachers do we need? How many science teachers do we need? So it, it also just has this uh, unpredictability element for public schools. Now, if we can, I want to cover, uh, come up with something, uh, a case that, you know, went pretty high up that, that FFRF won. What, what, what recently happened? That's kind of fun to talk about. Uh, which, which case do you have in mind? Well, I actually was thinking about the 10 commandments monument in front of the school doors, but, uh, you can talk about anything. No. Yeah. In Connellsville. Sure. I'd be happy to talk about that. That was a, a good one. Yeah. So, um, uh, there are, we're actually, uh, two Ten Commandments monuments that we we challenged, and our uh, our resident uh, Ten Commandments expert is uh, Patrick Elliott. He handles all of our, um, our our lawsuits and complaints involving these these monuments. Which it was this whole uh, amount of Ten Commandments monuments that went up to support the movie back you know whenever that was when the right. the movie The Ten Commandments came out. They they put out these monuments allegedly to try to promote this movie so they're, they're fancy movie posters is the idea but they're giant stone monuments that are usually in pu in front of um public schools and uh courthouses and whatnot so in this case uh it was a the, the only debate really was a procedural one something called standing that we have to deal with constantly where um when you bring a lawsuit you have to show that the plaintiff is the right person to bring the lawsuit that they were actually injured in this and in this case, the student at this school with the monument in front of it uh, was stopped. Go well, they were so they're in the middle school. The monument's in front of the high school, and they decided to go to a different high school because of the monument. They didn't want to deal with the monument every day, and so the lower court said, "Well, if you're not going to that high school anymore, then you're not harmed by it, so <laughs> you don't have stand. Therefore, you lose," which is absurd because it's yeah. the entire reason that they didn't go to the high school. So fortunately, um, the court of appeals overruled that. So that was a, a nice, uh, recent victory in, um, in Connellsville that we got that monument taken down and a good before and after, uh, picture of our, uh, our plaintiff, Marie Schaub, who's the, the parent in that case, uh, towering over the, um, the space where the monument, uh, once was. So that's a good one. And, and more personally, uh, in, um, in Shelton, Connecticut, we had a uh, a good uh, victory not too long ago. This one didn't. Uh, this was kind of a, a quick win. This didn't get uh, all the, all the way to a decision. Even we got this settled pretty quickly. This is this also goes to your your point about you know giving favored speech treatment to religious groups, and then when you ask for equal treatment, uh, all hell breaks loose. What was happening here was in Shelton, Connecticut, they had a um, a heralding angels display. So it was this lit up display with angels in a public park that was put there by the American Legion. And so uh, we have a, a member uh, named Jerry Bloom who lives in Shelton, and he contacted us about it. And I wrote to the city at first and said, hey, this is promoting religion. If you're going to allow this private group to put this here, you have to allow us to put our uh, our display up as well. So we asked to put up a banner that uh, we, a winter solstice banner. So it's celebrating the winter solstice and it has a quote on it from uh, uh, Anne Nicole Gaylor, who's one of FFRF's co-founders, 
uh, that, among other things, says there are no angels. So it's a direct counterbalance to this angel display. Sounds reasonable. And yeah, and but yeah, you would think so. But the city responded and said, "No, you can't put this up because we think it would be offensive to many residents." And we thought, well, that is not going to cut it. You can't just say, you you can't pick and choose based on what messages you think are offensive. Um, that's called viewpoint discrimination is the legal buzzword there. And so from the beginning, I mean, we, we, we I sent another letter that said, this is not something you're going to be able to defend. You need to come up with a better policy than this. And they ignored us essentially. So we, again, had to file a lawsuit. And um, when we did, they, this was, again, similar to the other case I was talking about earlier. Once the lawsuit actually gets filed, then I think they take it a little more seriously. The attorneys get together and talk and decide, okay, what do we have to do here? And so uh, we were happy to uh, to learn earlier this year that the um, the Heralding Angels display is not going to be going up. There is another park in Shelton where they have a nativity that another group puts up. So the Boy Scouts of America puts up a nativity, and they are going to let us put our banner in that park. So that that fixes everything. So that was a nice win. And that was also the first federal court case I've ever taken as an attorney. So that's that was kind of fun and nice to have that be a, a solid win. Yeah, I mean, not many uh, young attorneys get to have a federal court win. Yeah, especially on the other side of the country, which is another unique, you know, thing. But I, uh, I went to school in Portland, Oregon at Lewis and Clark. I now work in Wisconsin and I'm, I'm from Wisconsin originally, but then I filed a federal court case in Connecticut of all places. Well, that is absolutely fantastic. Ryan, is there anything that we haven't covered that you want to get in? Um, well, there's some other ongoing things that I, I think people, uh, I, I would love for your listeners to, to take an interest in, um, just to cover them quickly and, uh, yeah, you know, go, go to FFRF's website and our, our Facebook, our Twitter. You can follow us um, and uh, just keep up on what's going on. Um, some just examples, just to go through them quickly, uh, there are threats to the, the Johnson Amendment, which if, if you're not aware, you know, uh, look it up. But it's part of the tax code that prevents churches from endorsing political cam- candidates. And uh, we're currently actually suing Donald Trump over his executive order relating to that. But there is an attempt in the um, – the budget to uh, remove all funding to enforce the Johnson Amendment. So we're trying to fight against that. Uh, the There are churches in Texas that were hit by Hurricane Harvey that uh, have sued to try to receive FEMA funds. And this is actually, this is a really potentially catastrophic uh, lawsuit. If the churches were to win, this would be really, really awful. So it, it might sound like kind of a, a boring lawsuit, or maybe you're even sympathetic to the, the churches, I could understand that. But it actually, the precedent would be just terrible if the churches won, because the uh, the precedent would be that churches, actual houses of worship can receive taxpayer funds in order to rebuild the church. And that is terrible. There's There's no reasonable way to make a difference between repairing a church and building a church from scratch. I don't think that there's a legal way to parse that out very easily. And so it would be uh, really, really problematic if that, uh, if, if they end up winning. So that's something I think people should really pay attention to and try to, you know, get your voice heard that the, that state church separation cuts both ways. Churches get all sorts of benefits in state church separation, but the flip side of it is they don't get access to taxpayer funds. So that's just a couple examples of ongoing things and lots more, like I said, on our website and Facebook. What do you think of FFRF becoming a religion? <laughs> uh, I'm against it. Okay, fair enough. <laughs> it'd, be, it'd be like, uh, it, I mean, well, <laughs> it's, oops, my, my mic kind of fell on me there. It'd be, it'd be like asking, you know, about what about atheism becoming a religion? Not that FFRF is entirely made of atheists, but it's, it's like the, the common joke is, what do you think about bald becoming a hair color or off becoming a TV channel or abstinence becoming a sex position? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, 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 I'm with you philosophically, but I'm also kind of uh, disagreeing practically because uh, then FFRF and including yourself, you could say that you're called to this religion and you could get this giant housing allowance and not pay tax in your income. Yep. Yep. And we're suing over that too. Uh, 
Because I, uh, I mean, but we're taking the opposite approach. So yeah, yeah. You're, you're right that we we could play that game and try to say, you know, we want all the benefits of religion because religion is what we say it is. So give us all the benefits. But um, yeah, I think that that would it's just a little bit too intellectually dishonest for me. Fair and fair enough. Fair enough. So listeners, go check out ffrf. It's dot org. That's right. You, do you guys have dot com too? Or is that something else? Uh, you, you that is something it? else. I don't know what ffrf. All right. Well, takes don't you. go there. Go to ff. <laughs> rf.org real short website name you can find it uh go sign up it's 40 bucks if you're so inclined become a life or afterlife member and of course uh if you like the organization the uh, conference next year is in san francisco have they announced the specific location yet yeah they have although i don't remember it off the top of my head so you'll have to again just check out our website that's okay i'll I'll look at that and at the end of the show i'll put that in the closing comments if i remember uh, after after we get done with this. But uh, Ryan, Jane, thank you so much for your work, and I appreciate you coming on The Phil Ferguson Show. Yeah, thanks for having me. My mum only lied to me about one thing. Um, she, uh, she said there was a God. And, um... <laughs> but that's because when you're a working-class mum, Jesus is like an unpaid babysitter. Do you know what I mean? It's just sort of like, she wants you to be good. You know, the best of working class mum where I grew up could, she, she wasn't hoping I'd be a doctor or a lawyer. She hoped I wouldn't be stabbed to death in a barroom fight, you know. So, the best thing to do is, well, if, he, if he's God-fearing, then he'd be good. It's a good rule of thumb because, you know, I went to Sunday school from about the age of four till eight. There was just great teachings of Jesus. I love Jesus. He was my superhero. Um, he really was. God was magic, right? But Jesus was just a man. And what I loved about Jesus was he was kind. And he, he was brave, and I thought he was amazing. And um, I absolutely I thought he was brilliant, right? just a brilliant guy, you know. So I was about eight, and my brother must have been 19. He came in once, and uh, I was doing uh, something from the Bible. And I said, what are you doing? I said, oh, join Jesus. And he went, um, who was Jesus? And I said, well, he was, he was the son of God. He went, why do you believe in God? Right? And my mum went, Bob, shut up. And I knew she had something to hide. <laughs> and he was telling the truth. And I knew. I knew from body language. And then I worked it out and I was an atheist in an hour. In an hour? Yeah. You're listening to The Bill Ferguson Show. Well, of course, it's about that time to wrap up a show. And I was just thinking, I have a new toy coming. It's just a a little piece of equipment to hopefully tweak the sound of the show a little bit. But I've been watching the tracking from FedEx, and it's just so amazing. It left its location on the 25th, and then it goes to another location and another location, and it's there for a couple hours, and it gets turned around, and it gets put on a truck to another location, And then it went to Chicago last night, and it's in the local facility this morning at 5 a.m. And by 5.17, it's on another truck ready for delivery. And that truck is probably out at 7 a.m. making deliveries. And so somewhere later today, it will show up, and I'll have it for next week's show. But it's just kind of an amazing system that you can do that. Uh, Just kind of a little side thing for you. Did have a review on iTunes that I want to go over here real quick from Chuck in Glenshaw. I've been listening to the show for some time now. My initial interest was finance information, and I have gotten a lot from that. Phil explains many things simply and clearly. I also appreciate Phil's skeptical views and overall have enjoyed his interviews with people in the skeptical and atheist movement. So thank you for that kind review. Of course, if you like the show, Uh, Please go to iTunes or Stitcher, I think it is. Yes, and leave a review there. I greatly appreciate it. If you find value in this, because people ask me all the time about Patreon. I don't have a Patreon. Go give money to Secular Student Alliance, uh, Atheists of America, or the Freedom From Religion Foundation or something like that. I would appreciate that. Next week, we have an interview with Dr. Cyan Proctor. She is an astronomer, a geologist, an all-around science-y type person. She is also a professor 
and she was the person in charge of the eclipse party from a scientific uh, point of view at the American Atheist Conference a few weeks back in South Carolina. So we're going to talk science and maybe a little politics. Who knows? You'll have to tune in to listen to that. But this is a actually short-ish little show, so I'm just going to wrap up and thank you for listening. I greatly appreciate it. And if you're at an upcoming conference, I'll be in uh, Philadelphia in a couple of weeks, and then a week or two after that in Las Vegas for CSI convention. That's kind of like the replacement for TAM. Hope to see you there. And if you do see me, please feel free to say hello. Until then, ciao.